My name is Monica Thompson, and I do serve as the Executive Director for University of Career Services at the main campus. We're going to jump right into our presentation, and we've titled it The Powerhouse of Talent. If you've been around Houston the last, or heard about Houston the last couple of years, has been our largest campaign to describe our, our talent at U of H. So Powerhouse of Talent, supporting students' demonstration of marketable skills. And I'll have my colleagues introduce yeah. themselves just one more time because there's a lot of us up here. Yeah. Um, as Ginger mentioned, whoa, that's really loud. <laughs> um, as Ginger mentioned, I'm Tina Pallison. I'm the director for the Center for Student Involvement. I've um, been at the University of Houston just over three years. Um, and as I joined um, our campus community here, um, Pam uh, collected Monica and I and said, hey, we got to do something about this topic. Um, it's a hot topic here in the state of Texas, and we need to make sure that all the work that we're doing in student affairs and enrollment services um, in the co-curricular experience, we wanted to make sure that we were um, contributing to those marketable skills. So we're excited to share today about the great work that we're doing outside of the classroom and how we're measuring that learning. And good morning. I'm Pam Sheffman. Let me just move that a little higher. And I have been at the University of Houston now a non-consecutive almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen the University of Houston change and grow since 2000, and I'm a very also proud alumna of the institution. And in my role, I really have had the great privilege and honor to work with the different departments across the institution that really touch every part of the student's life, from the moment they're interested in our campus through admissions all the way through graduation and their interactions across campus. And one of the things through my looking at research is really looking at competency-based education and where has that field been going? And that was really the conversation that started. So when Tina's probably first week mm -hmm. here, I was Not like, really. we need to have lunch. Let's <laughs> sit down and talk about what this means for the Center for Student Involvement, the students that they work with and engage with on a regular basis. Um, and this was probably back when the coordinating board's first plan to really look at Texas education and completions, and what does that look like at the institution? And so one of the things that I recognize is this mirror between competency-based education and completion, and students being able to leave our institution saying, I came here to get what I was supposed to get. Because I've moved into higher education over 25 years ago, really focused on colleges and universities are where people become who they're supposed to be. Right? Not necessarily where their family or their background is, but really where their passions lie, who they are as people. And if we can help them understand that process while they're here, but then also document it to employers after they've left, what did they gain while they were here? Because that's one of the critical pieces is this bridge between I came to an institution, I graduate or left with a certificate degree or some kind of credential, but what did I learn when I was there? And so through our program, we're hoping to help students be able to talk about that more passionately, more about the things that they're really excited about, and in ways that engage the entire institution. So through today, we're hoping to kind of bring you into that conversation, let you know about the program that we developed. Um, so we'll kind of walk through some different things. So Monica's going to kind of go through our learning outcomes for today. Okay, hopefully you can hear me better now. Mm -hmm. So uh, just, and you may can see these slides, but if you can, I'll just kind of highlight we're going to talk about the understanding and the theoretical framework, fr framework that we use for the foundations of Scarlet Seals of Excellence. And we'll share that framework, that structure, and we'll talk about how we truly integrated career services from the beginning, which I was happy that Pam included me in the beginning uh, because it really takes all of us working together. Uh, we also will provide the context, our, our progress, and even things that we tweaked along the way. And we'll also hopefully encourage you through this presentation to integrate career services into your process, and we'll offer suggestions and advice along the way. So as we mentioned, the Scarlet Seals of Excellence has kind of been a program pretty much for like almost three years now, but it really did start with a committee. And what we wanted to do is create a foundation for a program that would be sustainable, um, but also rooted in what's going on across the nation, um, founded in other um, foundations and some theory uh, in terms of student learning outcomes and what does that look like. So one of the important parts was to spend some time in the work of others to see what are the learning outcomes for post-secondary higher education, what does that look like across a broader landscape, and how does that relate to us here at the University of Houston. 
So it was important for us to start looking at some of these other frameworks that exist. So Learning Reconsidered 1 and 2 really did lay out some foundations of post-secondary education outcomes from a learning mindset. What does that look like for students in terms of what they gain, not only in the knowledge base for the degrees that they're looking for, but also outside of the classroom things, their leadership and other skills. So we really wanted to look at Learning Reconsidered because it was one of the seminal documents that is important in this learning outcomes piece. Um, from there, we also looked at AAC and U and their LEAP outcomes. So what does that look like in terms of students' personal growth, their social growth, all of these outcomes? Also understanding that the Council for the Advancement of Standards, um, which look at the entire institution, so we have our program outcomes both in our academic affairs, but also what are the outcomes for students who are engaged in other ways across the institution. So the Council for Advancement and Standards really do encourage all areas, whether you're the student health services or whether you're in student involvement, all the way to facilities. Where are you embedding student learning in what you're doing? So they have specific outcomes in terms of cognitive complexity. How are we developing that in our students? Their civic engagement. What does that look like in terms of my ability to apply that practically? So those, the Council for Advancement of Standards was helpful. But here in Texas, when we look at where we are seated here, really important to think about what are the core outcomes for completion at the state of Texas level. The communication skills, things of personal responsibility, social responsibility, engagement, those are really important skills as well. So we really did spend time as a group, probably almost more than a half of a year, understanding the foundations piece, where these came from. So this is important to understand in terms of where we started. Um, we're going to share, so I know that I'm, I have a handout, actually two, mm -hmm. <laughs> that have some of these things on it, because we're going to work together as a group here, um, as more of a classroom setting, to talk about how does this apply to your institutions. These different groups have these foundational outcomes, and what is important at your institution, because every institution type is a little different. Every outcome for your campus might feel different, but some of these things are very foundational. They're very... Um, similar no matter where you are as at, across the state of Texas. But we didn't want to do this in isolation to these learning outcomes. We also wanted to create this strong bridge partnership with career services because we know our students hopefully aren't staying with us forever, right? And they need to leave. And so what do employers want and what are they looking at? So we really wanted to engage deeply with what's going on in career services. Thanks, Pam. So in addition to the intellectual research, we also wanted to ensure that the employability and marketability of our students at University of Houston. So we looked and we cross-referenced the intellectual research with what employers want. And if you've been involved in career services or looked at a lot of these ratings, these are the skills that employers say they want, in addition to the technical aspects of the job. And I see this consistently at the University of Houston uh, through the job postings. These are the skills that they want. And so we wanted to cross-reference uh, this piece and through the many months of research uh, that we conducted, um, it resulted in four competencies. And right now we're passing out handouts and we're going to do some work to really show how we integrated these. And you can look up these, these competencies really, they haven't changed much uh, from 2016 to the current year. Uh, the one competency that's been added is global and cultural competency. But everything else, teamwork and work ethic, it's been pretty consistent over the last few years. So what we have given you here, and it's tiny print, and I totally take ownership for that, but I wanted it to fit on a single piece of paper <laughs> um, so we could do this more of a workshop style. So as I mentioned, we had the different frameworks that we wanted to look at in terms of competency for our students and where does that come from? How does that map onto learning outcomes? Recognize that all of the resources that we've pulled together could stand alone as a session all about on their own, right? So we could spend an entire session understanding the LEAP learning outcomes and what do they look like and really kind of dig deep into critical thinking and how do you measure that? What does that look like? Does it look different for a student here in the Hilton College versus a student in our engineering programs? So that in and of itself could be its own program. But um, I'm asking you to take like, a leap of faith with me that these are really great, awesome learning outcomes that mm -hmm. other folks have spent a lot of effort working on um, and move from there to how does this apply to the institutions we are in? How does this outcome-based and understanding this piece 
fit to your institution. So as you read through, so we gave you all of the outcomes for all of the different areas in their own columns, so you can kind of see where they are, and think about what is important for you and your institution. If you were to ask yourselves, and maybe you already know that you have undergraduate learning outcomes for your institution that you know are important and maybe seated in these same foundational areas. So, but for you and your institution, what is important to you and what does that look like? If you were to pick, borrow, choose, and put them together, what would that look like? Also, what would you call it? Because critical thinking is a very large concept, right? And so it may look different at a two-year institution than it does at a four-year institution, than it does for a certificate program, than it does for a master's outcomes, right? So these are going to all look different based on what our institutions do. So I want you to spend some time on your own kind of thinking through this, and I gave you a blank column. So if you were to think about your core competencies, either within the programs you work or across your institution, because some of us are sitting at an institutional landscape and some of us are sitting within programs, so what, what matters to your institution? And maybe what would you call them? So you have a blank column. So I want to give you a couple minutes to read through what's on the paper in front of you and then use that blank column. So if you don't have something to write with, I'm sure we could figure that out. But I want you to start, use that paper, because I have another one for you as well. But I want you to write down what are the outcomes that are important to you, thinking about how would you map some of these different things to make one for you. And what does that look like? So I want to give you some time to do that independently. And we're going to talk as a table as well. So I want you to kind of spend some time, read them, own them for you, and then we're going to kind of talk about them as a table. So I'll give you a couple minutes to start with on your own, and then we'll move to the table exercise. Okay, first of all, like if you like, I've taught master's level courses and you say okay go do this activity everyone's like I'm gonna start doing something else I'm gonna read something else so thank you for participating I saw some really great dialogue I also forgot to recognize that you're probably sitting with people you don't know so I want to allow you some time to talk about your institutions as well because it makes sense when you talk about institutional context um, so I'm glad you got an opportunity to engage with maybe some people that you didn't have an opportunity to at the opening session so want to recognize that as we move forward as well. So what I want to be able to do is also tell you that um, the piece of paper that we gave you with a grid and all this stuff, we have extra blanks. If you wanted to, to get an extra one, we do have more of them. <laughs> um, also, um, we can share our cards if you need information afterwards as well. Um, but I do want to share as a group some of the conversation that was happening at your table. And for those, my, my daughter said I really operate well in a boot because I'm my foot's in a boot right now. They'd, most people don't know. So I've asked Monica to kind of walk around with a microphone. I'd like to share some of the conversation that you're having at your table because I heard somebody talking about how some areas, like they're really worried about the content area of the academics and some of these things like communication and other things really haven't been part of the dialogue. So I'd like to bring that to the larger group. So if anybody from the table would like to participate, Monica is ready with a microphone. Don't so be shy. Everybody all at once. Okay. All, all right. Then, okay. And then we'll go to the back, too. I'm Bobby Cubriel from Victoria College. Oh, yes, stand up. Please stand up, Bobby. Yes, no Thank problem. You. Um, I'm from Victoria College, and one of the things that we're asking our faculty to do to, to, to identify marketable skills that they're learning in their classroom, we all know that uh, as a junior college that we are, uh, our students graduate with an Associates of Arts or an Associates of Science, and they're asking us what can they do with those two degrees. They're general studies. They're not really learning a, a career or an occupation. So we're asking for our faculty to help us to identify those, those skills that they can then recall, hopefully within an interview when they're across the table or across the desk of, a, of an employer, that they can say, I learned this or I've gained this skill throughout my English or speech class. Of course, we all know that's kind of communications, but what else can you, what else did you learn? Obviously, attention to detail when you're writing those essays. You have to do the, more, um, the referencing, um, time management skills, uh, various other things. And so we're asking our faculty to kind of build a library for us and for their students for, and the advising office. I'm sorry, I work in the advising office. Uh, give, us a, give us a list, give us a library of what we can help those students to recall whenever they're building that resume, when we're preparing them for that interview, 
And that way, and asking also, I know that the, the faculty syllabi are getting longer and longer these days, but maybe one or two of those, of those um, bullets on there, that way a student maybe picks up one of them, if anything, or if they get one. Um, and that way we can hopefully regurgitate that. They can re recall it whenever they're in the interview and hopefully be able to sell themselves just by having the Associates of Arts or Science degree where they maybe don't have any actual or, uh, professional or, or work experience in that background. Great. Thanks, Bobby, for tying it back to the marketable skills piece yeah. as well. Somebody in this back table by the door, Monica? Yeah. Monica's I'm working coming. her way there. I'm coming. Short legs, walking fast. <laughs> Hi there, folks. My name is Betsy Castro, and I'm with the University of Texas at El Paso. And so I'm looking at my boss, who's right over here, and, and uh, I'm talking to my colleagues here, just sharing the fact that at UTEP, uh, we have something called the UTEP Edge, and the fact that we have high-impact practices, student employment, internships, research, and a lot of those, um, we looked at the results, student outcomes, and these are the things that we came up with in terms of what are our core competencies, competencies at UTEP and how they align with our campus and what makes us so unique. So definitely, you know, community engagement, global perspective, uh, professionalism are some of the things that we looked at, but I know and I'm sure Louie can talk a little bit more about this, it was, really was a long-term process that included student affairs and also the folks on the provost's office because it really had to be a joint effort. And so this is part of our SACS reaccreditation. And so it kind of, I th kind of was sharing with the folks, it's kind of nice that some of the folks already did some of the work back on campus. And so it just really kind of reaffirms what we're doing. Great. Thanks Thank for you. sharing. Anyone Other conversations? Else? Monica says she has short legs, but she's willing to run yes, to any of the I tables. I promise. Leap, <laughs> jump. All right. Thank you. See so if I can walk closer, someone will I raise their hand. I have slightly a counseling background, so I'm okay with awkward silence, so Thanks. I don't mind waiting. Alberto <laughs> <laughs> um, Quion is from uh, Austin Community College, and uh, we did talk about um, the differences between um, academic transfer and workforce as well, and how. Um, to bridge those two gaps, you know, how, how to present marketable skills in the not so easily, you know, identifiable courses like academic transfer and, and what does that mean to those, to those students and at, as well as at the university level and how they went about um, doing it. And, and the other thing we talked about is how students compartmentalize and so when they finish their English class, they think, oh, I'm done with English. Yeah, hot dog. But I'd never use it again. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, it's kind of up to all of their subsequent teaching. Because for, for many people, like composition one is in the very first semester. And so then how do faculty and say welding or I'm, I'm over. I'm also at. Um, I'm also at. Austin Community College, and I'm over all the workforce programs. And so how do the welding faculty say, well, remember when you learned an English class and how it applies to welding or how it applies to health, you know, nursing or, or those kind of things. So mm -hmm. that, that kind of was another theme that bubbled up for us. Yeah, the transferability across programs, across areas, and how important is that for students to recognize as well. Uh, I know when I went to college in... 80s and 90s, right? So that that time frame, it was like you just went and got your degree, and no one really about the expectations for that to bridge, right? That and being transparent to the student in terms of the outcomes, right? So I know our friend talked about making sure that it's on a syllabus. That not only are you going to gain the ability to do calculus, you know, 201 level work but you're gonna be able to communicate that or work in teams and those other skill sets that you're developing in the academic curriculum, but maybe you're gonna be using post-education, so when you're leaving the workforce. And so for us, it really was this partnership between what are these outcomes and what do they look like, but we're looking at also from the co-curricular lens. Are we actually telling students outside of the classrooms what are some of the engagement opportunities? What does the learning look like? And can we label that in a way that makes sense for a student to be able to articulate that after their experiences, right? So we're, that's kind of what we're hoping for in this, what are the core competencies and what do we care about piece? Any other conversations that we'd like to share? In the back. Back there.
um, to tie on that. My lingering question perhaps is a one-off, but it is what do you do with the students who are not entirely self-motivated, not entirely initiating, <laughs> not signing up for a program like this, who get three weeks before graduation go, oh, now what? And they rush into the career services office and say, help me write a resume. I've never needed one before. And so I think that's what keeps running through my head. Even last night at the panel, those students were fantastic, but I, I can't imagine any, any of our students being that motivated. And how do, you, like, how do we motivate them and, and get them to go and, and do and think along these lines before three weeks before graduation? And I think that's the partnership you're talking about, advising. Like as a student signing up for coursework, mm -hmm. are we talking about these already for them as important outcomes for the courses you're signing up for because you're going to leave your institution with these skill sets? You might not seek it, but it could be happening. And this transparency with the student as part of that conversation and not by obligation, but we're working on it. So how did that look? So I agree that. Some of them I will talk about how we were hoping this is going to apply to all students, not just the student government body president, but how do all students kind of find their niche in here. And so we'll talk about some of our plans moving forward, and we'll talk about specifically in the program. But I agree, those students that are just, and again, largely commuter institutions, sit in their car till class starts, walk to the class, go back to their car, wait for the next. So how do we reach those students in ways that are meaningful? And how do you start that as an institution, changing the culture? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. I was going to add for career services for that senior that's graduating in three weeks, we will have uh, special workshops for them, and we do have commuter pop-up events where we just meet them in the parking lot and give them information, and if we can get them to come into our office, we can help them, because oftentimes they're not thinking about their experiences and even articulating them on their resume, so just walking them through that process, and as opposed to just, oh, we have a resume workshop, we actually have to say, graduating in three weeks? Come talk to us. We'll help you develop a resume. And that speaks to them. That resonates with them. It's like this workshop was for me. And then on the, on the front end with our freshmen, we're going to uh, talk to them about the expectations and orientation and what's expected, whether it's a volunteer, work experience. Even if they have an associate's degree, they can still gain uh, experiential learning experience and internships. Okay, great. Anyone else? I know we need to move on. Any other conversations we'd like to share with the larger group? So um, Tina was able to pass out now this color-coded version of the same chart. So as a team, we went through this same exercise in terms of understanding the, all the different sources of learning outcomes, all the different language, and how do we communicate it in a way that's the same in our own institution. So it's helpful for us to know that there's all these learning outcomes that came from different places. But if half of the institution is saying, critical thinking and the other one saying problem solving and they, they're thinking they mean the same thing, even though as we know as a construct those might be different, right, in terms of the background and research, um, but in a program they might be saying they, they're exactly the same. So how do we come to some language, at least in the co-curriculum across the Division of Student Affairs and Enrollment Services, how do we create a common language so we're all working towards these outcomes in the same way and helping our students be able to look at opportunities that provide those experiences, but then be able to articulate them. So the color-coded one kind of tells you where we mapped our outcomes and what that looks like. So on the side, you'll see that our four big outcomes that we came up with was leadership and practice, diversity, social responsibility, and civic engagement, personal development and self-realization, creativity, thinking, and communication. So those are our four big buckets, and they're big, right? So if you look at just diversity, social responsibility, and civic engagement, that could be a really big bucket, right, that a lot of stuff happens in, but um, important to recognize. So on your tables, there's one handout that has the four blue or four, four red rectangles with some of the context underneath of it. So when we say leadership and practice, here are some of the finer skill sets underneath of that. So in there, you'll see some of the more fine-tuned understanding of what those look through. Mm -hmm. And so Tina is going to walk through our program for the Scarlet Seals of Excellence and kind of give you some more of the understanding behind all four of those. Yeah. Um, as Pam mentioned, 
uh, we did create this program. Um, we call it the Scarlet Seals of Excellence. We actually went through several different names um, and held several focus groups with students and said, what? It, it sounds like a simple thing. What do we call this? Um, but you want it to be relevant to your students, right? So we went through several different names. They told us they weren't cool. No students wouldn't go to that. They're not going to think that's exciting. But they came up with the name on their own. So I definitely encourage you to include your students in the process um, as you're creating and developing a program. So the name Scarlet Seals of Excellence actually came from the students. Um, we did uh, several focus groups, and they named the program. Um, and we've realized that um, they really do connect with it. Scarlet is one of our colors, scarlet red. Um, and being excellent is really important to our students. Um, and I'm sure at your campuses, um, for us, being a tier one institution and having that recognition um, does define excellence for us. So our students wanted to say, if we're going to participate in this, we're going to earn our scarlet seals, of pro uh, scarlet seals, we want it, people to know that we are excellent in these things. So that was important for them. So we make sure, made sure that we named it appropriately. Um, in the process. So we wanted to create a campus-wide system for this demonstration of skills and knowledge, right? We wanted them to be able to go through something they knew was credible, um, that it was seen as something as, as worthy, um, and that would be recognizable on a resume as something that sets them apart from their peers um, because they have this Scarlet Seals of Excellence. Um, we wanted to actually prepare them for life after UH. As we mentioned, um, the National Association for Colleges and Employers are looking for some of those skills. So we want to make sure that the program that we create actually gives them those soft skills that our employers are looking for. Um, so being able to have the skills, but then as we've talked about um, throughout so far, is to being able to articulate it um, and to share that in some meaningful ways. It's not just you didn't just run a meeting. You're able to manage organizational dynamics. You're able to work with a diverse student population. You're able to problem solve and conflict manage um, through your involvements um, outside and inside of the classroom. So that was important for us as well. We wanted to make sure that it was institutionally recognized. Um, and uh, I think the question in the back is making sure you've got that campus buy-in. And we'll talk through kind of our process um, and what we've done so far and what we're planning on doing um, as we continue to move forward, um, making sure that um, others across campus, our academic advisors, our supervisors, and those folks are trained and they are, are well aware of the program and that it's integrated into the fold of the institution. The other last piece that we definitely want to make sure we included was that there was some sort of motivation, right? Students just don't do things just to do them all the time, right? So we wanted to make sure that they got something from the process, right? Our students want to walk away with something tangible in their hands that they can say, this is what came from it. So um, we're wearing um, a gold one, but you can see it right there. They get um, a lapel pin for each one of the, uh, each one of the seals that they earn. And then um, and we'll pass this around as well um, at the end of their progress that they've earned all four. And we'll talk through that process in just a minute. Um, they get a graduation stole um, where they can pin all four of their seals on it and then wear it across the stage. Um, it's really important for us. The students that have earned them already are really proud of that. Um, we did a photo shoot over the summer of the folks that have earned their stoles, um, and they wanted them as their graduation pictures. Like, they're really proud of this accomplishment. So being able to give your students something that they can walk away with to motivate them to continue the process is really important as well. So, um, so I'm going to go through each of these outcomes. Um, as Pam mentioned, I'm going to borrow your handout really quick. This handout right here, Guide to Excellence, is going to be what I'm going to walk through really quick. But we have a this is up on our website as well for students to see. So as they go through and they want to earn each one of their seals, um, they know exactly what they're being measured on. Um, so this came from our mapping process. And you can see there's four bullet points under each one. We could have easily made this a 12-page document, right? As you can see from all of the outcomes, there's a million things that go in, as Pam mentioned, those buckets of competencies. It's too much for our students. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we kept it easy enough that they can manage it, but it's still valuable enough that these are going to earn them the skills um, that they need to be able to articulate it. So we boiled it down um, through many, many iterations. It took us a good probably 18 months um, to get to where we are, and then we refined a little bit more um, to get to a good place um, where we felt like we could share this. So this is what we've boiled it down to for these four competencies, but we encourage you to kind of figure that out for your own campuses. And what are the four five bullet points look like on your campuses as well. Um, so for leadership, we said that if our students are competent in leadership, we want them to be able to have and build meaningful relationships with others. They're able to collaborate with other folks. They're able to work on diverse teams 
um, they're able to navigate these organizational cultures. These are core skills that they're going to need to as they work, walk into that global workforce, right? Um, they're going to need to know how to work with others um, and lead a great team. We also want to make sure um, that they're able to um, have some sort of level of cultural competence. Um, that's hard to measure. Um, and those of you who do diversity work on your campuses know that that is um, a challenge always with faculty and staff, nonetheless, with our students. Um, but we also we want to know that they are aware of cultural-based um, subjects. They're able to advocate for other people that um, are different from themselves. Um, they have this sense of being able to give back to a community that they're a part of. Um, so we definitely um, want to make sure that they have that commitment. Um, and then can walk away with some way to articulate that to um, others as they're getting jobs. We want to make sure they have a good sense of self. They have an understanding of what their values are, what their ethics are, um, what they identify as personally, how they're able to manage their own emotions, um, how they're able to um, manage others and a team and be respectful in that process. Um, so that's definitely a core competence we want them to walk away with. And then lastly, thinking and communication. How are they able to think critically? How are they be, being creative and innovative in their work? Um, how are they able to communicate verbally and written um, and problem solve through things? So um, those are all on your paper, but those are some of the core pieces that we think as a student graduates from the University of Houston, what are those soft skills? What do we want them to walk away with? And those are our four things that we came up with. Hopefully, as you went through your mapping process as well in your worksheets, maybe some of those came up as well. You may have had others as, um, that you've added on that make sense for your campus. Um, but for us, keeping it to like four core things, four big buckets, um, really worked well for us. All right. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Um, that's a great question. We have not gotten to that phase yet. And I'll tell you about, um, as we get through it, we've um, piloted for two years. And I'll tell you, um, Pam will actually talk about that in just a little bit. Um, so we have done like a soft launch this year. Um, and we can talk through that piece. But that's a great question. Um, and, and just to reiterate, mm -hmm. the question was, how do you address mm -hmm. this program with a student who is online? Yeah. And so when we talk through mm -hmm. um, how students actually apply for the different SEALs, most of it is actually online. Absolutely. A student doesn't have to be in person mm -hmm. to apply for the Scarlet Seals in communication, thinking, and creativity. Like they apply for it all online. So it could be a, a completely available to an online student. Yeah. When we talk about some of our lessons learned, the marketing to that community mm -hmm. is a little different. Um, we mm -hmm. haven't quite figured out exactly all the ways to do that. And I think reaching to our faculty who teach the online courses will be probably one of the ways that we can make that happen. But with the exception of the stole, all of it is online. None mm -hmm. of it is in front of a person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, the, yeah so the question was, is the panel, the people who are doing the evaluation, yeah. is that all done online as well? And yes, it is. And so I will share some of what that looks like when we talk about the actual yeah. artifacts and the process. Yeah. So we will talk about that as well. Okay. Uh, if you can speak into the microphone, we're taping. Mm -hmm. It's not even a whole question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. That's fine. An addendum. Do, uh, does your institution have... <laughs> Please. My luck. <laughs> does your institution uh, also have an involvement record, student involvement record? So the question was about involvement records. So this is embedded in the involvement platform, which we can talk more about where that, what that looks like when we talk about the process mm -hmm. and the next steps. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's a good to know. Um, those of you um, who are familiar with the University of Houston, um, we have about uh, 43,000 students um, and just under 8,000 beds on campus. So we are um, go going, obviously, um, moving towards being a, more of a residential campus. But the majority of our students um, are commuters. They're not staying on campus, um, a, a significant number of online. Um, so we wanted to make sure as we created a program, um, it was accessible in a lot of different ways. And hopefully you'll see that um, as we move forward and talk through our process. And I think we had one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what has your interest been like from master's and doctoral students? So far, um, in all of our submissions, we have not had any graduate students apply um, thus far for the Scarlet Seals program. Yeah. That's I will say, question. though, in, in our working across campus, the College of Law is very interested yep. in these outcomes and how they can mm -hmm. help students demonstrate that. So mm -hmm. there has been interest to start pushing it to that population of our students as well. Yep. So talk about that question. as well. 
Any other questions about the at least the outcome buckets and what the four areas for the Scarlet yeah. Seals looks like? Okay, mm -hmm. we're going to turn over to Monica. She's going to kind of talk about how this engages with career services and that area. All right. So we've been talking about employability and, and making sure the students are marketable and that they're gaining the skills that they need that employers want. And we've already shared that information. But I wanted to just highlight these are some key comments from some of the executives around the world. And really, it's, it's a lot to read, but really, they're still looking for those soft skills. One of the things that made our program a little bit unique, because I know there are other models out there, is the diversity piece. If you've heard anything about the University of Houston, we're the second most diverse university. And so we wanted to really talk to students about what does that mean? How do you articulate that in the interview? So you can say I go to a diverse campus. I love it. But can you demonstrate or articulate the examples of why you would be a value add to that employer? Because mm -hmm. diversity is one of the core competencies at many um, em em employers. Mm -hmm. So we talked through that piece as we're preparing them for their submissions and cover letters and resume. And we'll dig a little deeper into that. But we know that employers were looking for those soft skills, teamwork, critical thinking, a lot of the buckets that you see before you. Oh, is that pilot? So what I wanted to talk about really quickly is before we talk about the actual process is where we started and where we are. So when we first started at piloting in um, 2016, there was even a state conversation about these marketable skills in terms of what do those look like. And our first iteration of the program, again, we involved students in, through the focus groups and what are they looking for. Um, we started creating some of these measurement tools. We have a rubric, which I will show you, which was not where we started. <laughs> um, but the online platform was a critical piece for us. Um, the accessibility for students to be able to submit their materials, kind of where they're already operating, um, was an important part for us. Um, so if we use our Get Involved platform, um, which is the branded version of an engagement platform. So students are, who at least the ones who are engaged in student organizations are already there. So we're also talking about how to move students who aren't already in the student organizations to start using that platform as a space for their engagement, even if they're not primarily part of that. So focusing on that tool, understanding how it works, what does the submission process look like? And again, we had different versions of our form. So when we first started in our pilot A, we call it, um, we asked students to provide many more artifacts about every single one of the areas. So when you look at leadership and practice and looking at collaboration, we asked them to submit artifacts that demonstrated collaboration, which could have been you know, a letter from an advisor of a student organization they worked with that told a story. It could have been from, I'm in student organization A, a student organization B submits a letter of support saying I was collaborating. And you can imagine how that became overwhelming to students. So within our first couple of months, students were like, this is just too much to provide. I can tell you the information about collaboration. I can tell you what that looked like. Do I need to pull all these things together? Because then it became an additional amount of time for the students to share and, and our real big goal really was the articulation. So in, within pilot A, we started narrowing that down because it also the subject matter experts that we were looking for, we went to our colleagues across campus. So we talked to academic affairs, met with the undergraduate committee and said, we'd love to have subject matter ex, uh, experts from the College of Communication to come and sit and be on the panels for the communication. We'd love to have some of our Bauer business faculty come in and help be on our panel of experts. So in that pilot A, we started kind of collecting more folks across campus to kind of sit on these panels to be able to evaluate. So P pilot A was much smaller, I think, in scope in terms of the number of students that we engaged, but was really about fine tuning the process. And what does that look like? Um, we will say we went to Sam Houston State. We talked to Adam and some of his colleagues. And they're like, here's how we do it. And so that's when we turned our artifacts into this collaboration with career services, where the cover letter and resume needs to speak to this competency area. And so that was important for us in Pilot A to kind of narrow it down to something that was manageable for the students, but also something that they needed to do. And so if we can move students to doing that earlier on in the process, that would be great. So where we are now in the second verse is so we revised a lot of things based on the assessment and the feedback that we were collecting. 
Um, so the submission process is streamlined for the students. They have a portal where they submit their resume and cover letter, uh, and that is now translated e e electronically to the panel. So the panel doesn't have to like receive a packet via intercampus mail, right? We get an email from the program saying, as an evaluator, you have a student's, their materials are available for you to view online, and then they have a link to the rubric so you can put the rubric online. So all of it now is electronic, which is great. That submission process is streamlined a lot. Um, also, we have a website now that students can go. They can pull up some other materials, and I'll show you what some of those artifacts look like. Um, but then we started developing this collateral. The pins um, are part of the process now that the students can see. Um, and actually having a ceremony for students was an important part of the process as well, inviting them and their families close to graduation to get their pins, to get their stoles was also an important part of it. So throughout that process, we've awarded 26 pins already to date, and we're, now we're, we've got a lot more going on right now. So and all of our evaluators are quickly, like everything Friday was the deadline, so they're now quickly evaluating and doing that process so we can figure out how many do we have now. So um, this part in Pilot B has been growing. The students are really excited about the opportunity to be engaged, and so um, we're definitely looking at this as a more broader implementation implementation across campus. Here's the process now. So you're itching for this, right? Probably like, what does this even look like? So here's what, as Pam mentioned, the pilot kind of refined our process. Um, it was pretty intense the first year and we realized it was too much. So here's where we've landed. Um, a student says, I'm gonna play student right now. I said, God, yeah, I really think I have this leadership thing down. Um, got some good experiences, I've been the president of my organization, or I've been a member, I've planned this major event. I think I've gained some really great experiences. Um, while I've been here at the University of Houston, I have, I understand this competency, right? So they would get online. Um, there's a link. I don't know if any of you um, have some sort of system. on. We use Collegiate Link on this campus. If you have some sort of similar um, portal online um, on your campuses, we use uh, Collegiate Link for us. They get on, they click a link, and they say, I'm ready. We wanted to make this, as Pam said, as relevant as possible. Um, we wanted it to be that they submitted a cover letter because maybe after um, college they're looking to get a job. So they have to write and get some good practice in, in writing a cover letter. Or maybe they're going to graduate school, so they need to write a personal statement. Um, so we wanted that to be reflective of kind of preparing them again for that life after college. It's going to give them good experience. Um, so they would write a cover letter or personal statement um, reflecting their learning on their competence. Um, as you have the, the rubrics with the red boxes on it, we encourage them, use that as a guide. If you follow and um, share with us your experience around each of those bullet points, you give some good examples um, of how you've learned that and what you've learned from that competence, um, you'll be successful. So we want it to be as transparent as possible. We want students to be successful and that they know exactly how to articulate their learning, right? Um, so we encourage them, fill out all four bullet points based on the guide. Um, and that will um, hopefully lead to success. Also submit your resume, right? We wanna make sure your cover letter or personal statement is reflected on your resume. We've actually seen a lot of that in some of our submissions of you've talked about being an RA, but that's not on your resume. That's good feedback we can share back with our students as we review. Uh, the things that you say here should be reflective in each of your pieces. Once again, a great connection with Career Services um, and um, our office is we can coach our students through that so they are more, once again, more prepared for life after college. Um, the submissions all get reviewed from experts, um, those trained experts Pam mentioned. Um, we have reviewers for each of the competencies um, that review every single submission um, based on a rubric, and we'll show you some of those examples as well. Um, but the either, they're gonna get a congratulations, we think you've done a great job of articulating your seal, and they get awarded, and then they'll get their um, fancy pin that they can um, have as well, um, or they'll get feedback. There's times, right, that our students don't do the best job. Um, so we give them feedback and we offer them coaching. Um, so we have the Center for Student Involvement is trained as coaches, and then University Career Services is also, her, Monica's whole team is trained as well. So we offer coaching as well, and then students come in, set up a personal meeting, um, and get some coaching. We'll give you some advice, we'll help you refine, and then you get to resubmit again. There's no maximum times a student can resubmit. Um, I've had... Um, so a couple of students who have to submit a couple times, one or two that do a third time, but you know, by the end, they've got it um, and they are able to articulate. So it's an ongoing process, an ongoing communication process with our students. 
So step two, hopefully um, they get approved. Once they do that for each of the seals and they've earned all four, um, then we wanna make sure that they're able to integrate their learning, right? So it's not just about knowing about leadership. It's not just about diversity. It's not just about thinking and communication. What does this mean holistically for your experience? How are you able to integrate that learning and say, here's how I am ready for the workforce using all of these marketable skills. Um, I can actually make sense of all of this and make meaning behind it. So once they have all four, um, we shoot them a quick email and say, hey, are you wanting to already do a panel? Um, so we get a panel of experts and that's faculty, staff, um, faculty and staff, yep, <laughs> that are a part of those. People that we think we're our experts in leadership, you're experts in diversity, experts in um, communication. Um, we have one person from each of those competency areas sit on a panel um, and the students come in and they can present however they want to. We leave it open. Um, most folks will, will pick a PowerPoint. Um, some folks will just just choose to speak. We give them the opportunity to either create a video or a portfolio, whatever speaks to their experience, some way for them to articulate that learning. They go and present in front of a panel of experts. The panel of experts are provided with a rubric based on these outcomes, and hopefully they get approved um, and that they're able to verbally articulate. So it's a two-part um, learning process, right? That they're able to articulate in writing through their seals, and then that also they're able to articulate um, verbally um, and orally to a panel um, of experts. Does that make sense? Good. And if you want a handout on that, so the one that has the four stars, oh, yes. the handout with the four stars kind yep. of walks through that process as well. It's one of the Absolutely. Um, collateral that we use when we're talking with students yeah. so they can walk away and keep that piece of paper and remind yeah. them of the four different seals and the mm -hmm. process and how every seal is individual and you want to be able to demonstrate yep. those competencies individually, but how they eventually come back together as this entire holistic experience and how you can integrate them together for the stole. Yeah. So that's an important part as well, just to have that all together on one sheet. Yeah, that, that handout, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, definitely, it's our, it's our flow chart. And, and again, post it on our website. We wanna make sure that our students know from start to finish, here's what this process looks like. So that's posted on our website as well um, for students to know kind of here's the flow, here's how this will work. The other piece I didn't add is that they can do this on their own time. They don't have to do all four in one year. They don't have to do it all in one semester. We, um, as Monica mentioned, are introducing this at orientation. So they know, ah, this is something I wanna achieve before I graduate. Um, they could do one every year. They can do all four in one year if they want to. Um, they could do a couple at a time. It's up to them. Um, we don't want to define um, where learning happens. Um, we know that it's happening outside the classroom with the work we're doing in Division of Student Affairs and Enrollment Services. We know it's happening inside the classroom by far um, with the group work and the projects that our faculty are doing in the classroom as well. So wherever they're getting that learning, um, put it together. We want you to know that uh, we're in this together. It's a campus-wide process um, and that you can pull in learning from volunteering in the community um, to your employment job um, at Starbucks in the Student Center. You're probably learning how to work um, and serve different folks at, with good customer service. So wherever you're getting that learning, pull it together um, and do it at your own pace. Um, that's important for our students here at the University of Houston because we do have students that um, are balancing lots of different priorities, which many on your campuses are as well. So making sure that accessibility um, is, is there is, is important for us as well. And we did wanna share with you kind of an example that we share with the students. So Shasta's not a real person. That's one of our mascots, <laughs> just so you know. Um, we want the students to understand, again, this understanding of the how do you communicate these skills in ways that are meaningful outside of, you know in your head what being and operating within a diverse environment looks like, but how do you share that? How do you share your passion for civic responsibility? Where did that come from? And how do you tell others about it? So we provide these examples for the students and the guidance that they get from coaching, from career services to also format this in ways that are meaningful for them. And we encourage them to really pull from multiple resources. Again, understanding our students come with lots of experience mm -hmm. from other places. You know, um, part of my master's program was in rhetoric and communication. So I have the pleasure of sitting on the panel for that group. And oftentimes the students will use the same example and I will have to provide the feedback and say, mm -hmm. I understand that yes, you have an important role at your off-campus job and you did learn how to work with the team and communicate their expectations of making shifts and those kind of things important. 
but you are also in these three other things on your resume that is not reflected at all in your cover letter. And so for an outsider, you want to understand that the student's able to pull different experiences to be able to talk about their competencies. So they get that feedback as well. So we try to use that. So this typically is what an evaluator will see. They'll see a cover letter and a resume. And we um, encourage them through the training that they look at both of them side by side, because that part is important. So when they move to the rubric, <laughs> that, that's my Sorry. So when you move to the rubric, you're able to look at the skill sets. So if you, can, this is just an example version for you. We encourage them to provide feedback on all of the areas within the air. So if we're looking for this one's communication, so we really want them to evaluate all of the material and be able to pull together some feedback to the students. We want them to hear from an evaluator's perspective where that sits. We also want them to understand that if they didn't meet the criteria in the rubric, why not? So in this one example, um, if they didn't get to accomplish, they got to high emerging, why not? And so we want them to know how they can move forward in their competencies, but also how to articulate that to an outside audience, which is an important piece as well. Um, so that's just so you see, this is an all online, so this is a digital rubric that we have for mm -hmm. our evaluators and that the students are able to understand what the different levels are and that the goal really is for them to be able to demonstrate an accomplished level in that competency area. Okay, and so one other thing that we will do uh, throughout is give them coaching. And I also just want to remind you that the PowerPoint is posted on the conference site under Media Materials. Thanks, Ginger. She's mm -hmm. we're taking lots of pictures, which is fine. But mm -hmm. you do have uh, this reference. Yeah. So uh, throughout the process, the students have access to all of these resources, training. We've coached staff in different areas. They receive feedback. I will add to the employer piece. Even though we did a student focus group, we also did a focus group with our employers that actually come on campus and recruit. And we talked to them about being able to recognize this skill, you know, this achievement on our resume template. So that's still new to the employers, but they were very excited that we were actually doing this and um, was really connected to it. So the students will receive feedback uh, from the staff. And even in the rubric, when we're giving feedback, a lot of times I'm encouraging them, come back into career services so you can get coached and developed on your resume, on your cover letter. Because even though they've been reminded throughout the process, I think when they get that immediate feedback, because Pam showed an example of a 93%, um, <laughs> Some of them are not at 93%. So we want them to achieve that. Uh, and we really need, we can infer that some of the examples are there and they have the experience, but we want them to articulate it just as if they would on a real cover letter. So we want to make that relevant. Some of the artifacts may not be as relevant to looking for a job, but all the students, they have to develop a cover letter. And a lot of times students really don't want to write a cover letter. So it's good to kind of force them to think about articulating those examples and then being able to verbalize those in the interview process. And then that should be on their cover letter as well as their resume. And I think a lot of times they think, oh, I could just do a general example, but we want them to go a little deeper. We want to see that reflective piece in their critical thinking and, you know, self-awareness and all of that. And so that's why it's kind of bullet pointed on the resume example. Um, let me go back. No, oh, the other way. There you go. Mm -hmm. One more. There One you. more. So that's why it's bullet pointed there because those uh, points are things that they should talk about. And when I look at a cover letter and I don't see those points as just one big paragraph, I know they didn't dive too deep with it. So this is really helpful uh, for me because I actually assess the personal development one in the process of doing that now. So, mm -hmm. so again, these are the resources, uh, feedback, training. There's a rubrics. I love that we have a way for the students to look at the templates. Students like examples. We don't want them to follow word by word, but it's a template from that was really helpful in our second pilot. Also really important to understand that we did not do this in a vacuum and that we have campus-wide partners that we really relied heavily on in order to make sure that this was going to be relevant to our campus community. So within our academic affairs, um, it was really important that we did talk to the undergraduate committee because um, they are really representative of the faculty across campus. And to share where we were in the pilot, ask them about not only being participants as expert reviewers, but how do they see this working with their students. 
and trying to co collect and gather that feedback from them was important. So we, we need them to be a continual partner in the work that we're doing, as well as some of our colleagues across the campus. In that beginning part where we looked at the foundations, folks through our honors college who are interdisciplinary, they were able to help us understand um, some of how that is translated for their students, also our business school partners. So a lot of the academic affairs really were engaged. Also, Monica did mention that our employers here in Houston were really important. The folks, we actually hosted a focus group for them to come, and t we shared with them the program, and they said, okay, here's what we like or here's what we don't like. Um, we also came into a room like this when they were here for a career fair and just mm -hmm. sat down with different employers and talked about it and shared with them and said, we need your feedback. So really engaging them in different ways because employers really aren't going to leave downtown to get to here to tell us. So sometimes you have to go to where they are as well to collect their feedback. But then within the Division of Student Affairs and Enrollment Services, um, a lot of folks who are touching the students outside of the classroom are really important partners as well. Um, in the pilot, I didn't really explicitly say, but in our first pilot group, the staff and housing was a critical uh, piece to that pilot. So we really talked one-on-one -on -one because they have resident advisor training. They have front desk supervisors. They have students who sit at the card swipe spaces. So talking to them one-on-one -on -one with the students in those areas as in specific partners at the beginning. Same thing with campus recreation. Campus recreation is one of the large employers on campus for student employment. So really talking to them and talking to the students who work there, you might be the lifeguard at the pool, but you're learning these important skills in leadership. And here's how that looks and how you can apply it on your resume and connecting them early on when they just start working at the rec center in, through this program. So those are partners that were really important. Um, we did have folks on our marketing team because as we go through our lessons learned, that's going to be really important. Our orientation team was also in our pilot group. So the ad ambassadors who walk backwards across campus are doing great things with communication and how are they using those skill sets they're gaining through that opportunity and demonstrating that on a broader way. And then our university registrar, also a really key partner. As we move forward, how do we document this in a way that stays in the student record, which is a critical piece and yet very difficult for a lot of us institutionally. If you work in an academic department, you know, oh, I want to start a new program in this academic area, and six years later, maybe we have one, right? Mm -hmm. So partnering early <laughs> with the registrar is really important to be able to figure out how do we tie this in the student tables in ways that connect this and with the potential of maybe being included as co-curricular involvement on a transcript sometime in the future. So it's not there now, but that's part of our partnering now in order to make it happen in the future. This has been a process for us. As we mentioned, we started these conversations in spring of 2015. Um, so here we are, we're about to wrap up, uh, the, you know, spring of 2018 um, and kind of fine tuning our process. So um, it hasn't, um, it, it's been an exciting process, but man, we have made a lot of changes along the way. So we wanted <laughs> yes. to share um, kind of our lessons learned to maybe help you, um, if not bypass them, learn from our lessons um, and make it a little bit easier on your campuses. So um, as we mentioned before, really focus on streamlining your process, um, simplifying it, but not losing that, um, that rigor and that value for your students is important. They are stretched thin as it, all, as it is um, with all of their commitments and leadership opportunities and their coursework and all of those things. So really trying to make sure that you're streamlining it, um, integrating it in all the places you can um, so they are hearing um, a common language and a common process. Um, making sure you incorporate technology um, is really important. Um, and we've refined this process quite a bit, right? Our students are online much more than I will ever be. Uh, but making sure that we're meeting them where they are, creating that, it's an online submission process. They get online feedback. Um, our uh, panelists and reviewers um, are able to do all their reviews online. The only time we really come in person um, is for obviously for trainings and things like that, but is for that panel review um, that we can do um, some back and forth and that simplifies it. Once again, is that we can broaden our reach um, with students, we can broaden our reach with faculty and staff reviewers as well because they can do it wherever they are. Um, that was really important. 
Um, and then providing that training for supervisors and advisors was important too. Um, we can't be the only holders of the knowledge, right? So we have to make sure that we're doing a roadshow um, and we're going out there and training our academic advisors. We're training our campus rec supervisors. We're getting into RA trainings. We're um, getting into talking to um, different uh, campus partners that have that student buy-in with, um, with, um, with big populations of students. Um, we know that this isn't going to be an overnight process and that all of a sudden next year we're going to have thousands of applications for the Scarlet Seals of Excellence. Um, but the more and more we create um, these pockets of students that know about it, they'll talk about it with their friends and they'll share it because they'll see the stole and they'll see these pins and they want to know how they can get it as well. Um, so making sure that we are creating a training that we can start doing the road show across campus and creating that um, campus buy-in. And then uh, to add to that, because mm -hmm. towards the end, we definitely created the, the pins and the stoles and the marketing, but I would say incorporating marketing early on mm -hmm. uh, and just having a road show for faculty, a road show for students, getting on um, meeting agendas, and that's a lot. Going to orientations, speaking with the orientation leaders. So really just sitting down, it's like, who all needs to be involved? Where are they? How can we get it scheduled? Um, I remember having all this information in my head but then at some point, I needed to go and tell my team and say, yeah, that one extra thing you're going to do, mm -hmm. uh, we need to train you on that because, you know, we're, we're involved and we're integrated. So it comes to a point where you're no longer working on the work and the process. You need to involve a marketing expert because, as you can see, it's a lot of theoretical uh, language here. But how do you break that down for a student that relates to social media that maybe we don't in the way that we, they do. And so they, the marketing expert really simplified those steps for us, uh, and that was really helpful. And then marketing expert asked questions like, well, what does this mean? Why this process? Why next? And that really challenged us. Uh, the next thing is creating an advisory board so we can con continue to get that constant uh, feedback from our campus partners uh, because they really – kind of change the game, giving us that feedback and just being open to receive it. Because you can imagine you get tied to something, which I think is kind of like our baby, but we want to get that feedback to improve the process, to make it approachable, to make it, you know, easy for students to understand and relate to and be motivated to actually participate. And then just refining the, the program, you know, going from, they didn't even want us to use the word artifacts. I know you heard it a lot today, but like, what does that mean? But when we said resume and cover letter, like, yes they can relate to that. Mm -hmm. So that's just one piece of refinement that uh, a lesson learned that I wanted to share with you. And then Pam will do our last three. And I would say also through that piloting process, the engagement of the students was critical. So I, I would say that in our A and B versions, the students really have been the voice of what's gonna work for them. Mm -hmm. Because again, when we originally said, we want you to provide all these artifacts because then we can have some direct measures of your learning, which are very important. The students weren't having any of it, right? So we have to meet the students where they are and be able to help them be able to articulate those skills. Because again, students come to our institutions to become better people, but they aren't able to always tell people what that is. And so that really was important in this, where are the students in that communication and how do we do that with them in mind, but with them engaged in the process. So piloting with the students is an important part of the entire process. Um, also, one of the things that we're moving towards is how do you map, from our perspective from the co-curricular, all of those opportunities to these outcomes. So it's important for students to recognize, if I'm going to go to a lunch and learn, does this map to the diversity outcome? And so we talk about that during that lunch and learn and we also use the Scarlet Seals as an opportunity that after you've had this lunch and learn opportunity and you've been able to apply this skill set, maybe you can apply for the Scarlet Seals as well. So important to have this opportunity menu for students to be able to link it to the program. Also critical, which means engaging more people, right? The more people that are doing things on your campus, because we don't own what students' learning looks like in leadership, right? It's everywhere. So how do we make sure that we provide that menu of opportunities, but it incorporates everyone from across the campus? But then again, the career services link is also important because if the students need that advisement on what is on their materials, career services really are our experts in how do you write a resume that's going to really resonate with 
the employers after here. So that's an important part. And also important part in the reviewers understanding as well. So when we, you do training is here are the materials students are going to turn into you. Career services is a really critical partner for that because not all of our faculty are hiring students. Right? So they're not used to reading their resumes or looking at their cover letters the same way that a career services expert is. So bringing them together in the same room is an important part as well. So career services has really been a critical partner for us in making sure that it's meaningful to students, it's going to help them when they leave, but that it's also bringing our campus together and understanding these pieces. Also, the faculty are important because as much as we think that in student affairs folks and their happy worlds, that they might live in our buildings, but they're in front of and with faculty as well. So making sure that we're all working together is really important. So the communication with the faculty is a critical part. And as we create these roadshows, as we're moving it forward, making sure that they're engaged, because scalability is important, right? So we talk about how it takes a lot of people hours to make this work, right? So the students are doing their articulation and, and the career services staff working closely with them, but somebody's got to read every single one of those cover letters. Somebody's got to read every single one of those resumes and take the time to really thoughtfully complete a rubric in a way that's helpful mm -hmm. for the students, right? So it has to be scalable. And we can't just rely on a small subset of our campus to do that. And we know that our faculty are engaged with our students in meaningful ways, and they want to be able to help our students as well. So the more we can work together, it will help us with that scalability across campus. Because it can't live in just one department. If you want it to be part of the outcomes and marketable skills for your campus, the more partners you have using the same language, these are the marketable skills we want our students to gain. And we're mapping it in ways that are meaningful, and we're engaging each other in that process. It's been super helpful and will continue to be even more powerful as we move forward. Because mm -hmm. the marketable skills conversation, as you know from the 60 by 30 plan, is not going away. This is an important goal at, at our institution, but in, within the state of Texas. So important to putting that in context and having people understand that. And as we reach out for more people to participate, continue using that language. That this is a marketable skills campaign. It's an understanding that students are learning these things in ways both inside and outside the classroom, but how are they articulating it in ways that they, others understand what they've got from our institutions. So important part as well. Yeah. And I would add, um, if you haven't already, you're starting to be asked in the survey mm -hmm. from CB, how, what are those programs look like, those marketable skills programs? How are you collecting that information? So it would be great if you could have something in place and be able to you know, share that information out. Uh, I had someone in the back comment where the first question they asked, like, well, how many people do you have on your team? So I feel that I don't have a large team, but I was reminded today, yeah, you're, you're pretty blessed. So mm -hmm. we have about 14 people. I have three teams. I have nine career counselors and, like, a team of 4.5 employee relations and alumni team. But we serve 45,000 students. So if you're that person in the back that just have one career service mm -hmm. per, uh, professional, I would say incorporate maybe some student leaders or mentors that, are, that have this experience and have them be your ambassadors or volunteer a couple hours of their time to kind of help and coach and develop. And as much as you can put on the website and meet them where they are online, website, have templates, that's really helped because a lot of times they are, when they're doing their submissions, they are really sending back to mm -hmm. me the template of the resume and the cover letter. So I know they're, that they're reading that piece. But I, if, if anyone want to talk to me about resources or anything like that, we all will be available. But I do understand that there may be a limit to staff, especially as you're trying to integrate career services in your uh, process. Anything else, Tina? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we wanted to leave time for questions that you may have, uh, whether you want to ask that now openly, and then we'll also be available for 101, and we will provide our contact information. And I just want to remind that if you have a question, we can either run the mic to you or you can come up. <laughs> it's already in the middle. Um, so, But we want to, because you may have a question that somebody else has the same question. So don't hesitate to reach out. Let us know what your questions are. Thoughts about the program? And I would say this is very, very doable. I, I remember um, I've only been here close to four years, came from a larger institution. I was not part of student affairs, and I wonder, how is this going to work? And now it's just second nature as far as our process and having an online submission, and so it really does work. So do students wear 
do they get their stoles and pins in enough time to wear them at their college graduations? Is that that's what's driving it, so that they'll they'll be ready to do it at their individual graduations? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. yes. Okay. So again, I just mentioned that Friday was if you wanted to have the stole for this in graduation, time. Friday was the deadline to mm -hmm. submit all of your materials to get your pins because we need an extra couple of weeks to schedule the reviewers to do the panel part because that does take a little coordination of everyone's schedule. And so. one more question we uh, maybe didn't hear. How many students have you actually had complete mm -hmm. um, the stole with all four pins? Yeah. Um, so our first year for our pilot, um, we had six, six students um, achieve the stole, which was, uh, in my mind, impressive because they did it in a year. Um, and then we gave out uh, 28 individual pins as well. Um, and this last year, which was our second year of a pilot, because we refined it, um, refined our process a little more, um, we'll probably get up to um, about uh, probably seven or eight stoles. Or like Pam said, our deadline was Friday, Friday and actually got a few more in. over the we're weekends. In. We're being a little bit more flexible with that. So we're in the process of reviewing. So I'm hopeful that they'll be successful in their review. So I don't have a final count on the pins, but I anticipate it'll be pretty similar in our um, second year of a pilot. Um, so it's exciting. And I, and I think the other piece I would share is that several students have approached us of we just want to do two right now. So we're going to finish it up um, before we graduate. So our pinning ceremony is scheduled for May 3rd. Um, so they'll get it before graduation, which I believe is May 14th, I think so. Um, so in, in enough time. I was just curious if at this point, I know that more or less longevity speaking, it's in its infancy, and this is really amazing. Have you thought or is it within your visionary scope to consider how you could envelop dual enrollment students mm -hmm. into, because I could see this as a tool for matriculation. I just didn't know if that was something yeah. you guys had even thought about yeah. at this point. Um, it, that specifically hasn't come up, okay. but I think one of the things I will share um, is that we, we have intentionally left the process open that a student can pull from any of their experiences. So whether they're getting their experience from their dual enrollment or they're getting it from volunteering in the community or being an RA um, or that biology class that they had this really comprehensive project in, they can really pull experiences from anywhere. I think the catch with what you're saying, um, and as we um, fully launch this next year, is really making sure we're bringing in campus partners in that marketing piece. That um, if you're an advisor for that dual enrollment student, they, you at least have the knowledge um, of the basics of the program to be able to share, hey, you have this experience coming in um, from your other dual enrollment um, experience, and we want you to be able to pull it in. So um, that's intentional, knowing that our students are bringing in experiences from all different places. It doesn't matter where you get it as long as you put it all together. And it's part of the conversation during that training piece is we talk about the students will share with you their experiences where they feel like they're building competencies. So you have to be open to a student, a military-connected student, who said, yeah. I have traveled all of these places through my experiences, and that's where I've gained this competency. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really open to where our students are coming from because we have a large percentage of our students who transfer. So it could have mm -hmm. been that they were a student body president at San Jacinto College, and now they are here with us as a junior student, and they want to share how those two experiences together right. created something. So we want to ha we have those conversations during our reviewer training, and mm -hmm. that um, allowing students to be able to do that in meaningful ways. I will say, though, one limitation that we do talk to people about is we want this to be connected to their post-secondary experience. So if they do have something before post-secondary, and they bring that in, as long as they connect it to their post-secondary mm -hmm. educational experiences, it's relevant. But we don't want people to come in and say, I did this as a sophomore in high school, and I want credit for it mm -hmm. here. We want them to be able to connect the post-secondary educational experiences to some of those competencies. They will carry those experiences, and they're very valid. But our real goal is to have them be able What's to articulate what did they get from our institutions yeah. as post-secondary institutions? You can connect the dots of your growth and development over time, which is valid and important. But if you can't connect it to your post-secondary educational experiences, um, you're not going to gain one of our seals because that's a cred credential, that not really, um, mm -hmm. way for us to talk about it at our institution that we can translate it to our employers. We have a question here. Okay. 
Y'all presented a lot of information in a short period of time, and you've done it very well. Thank you. But I just want to make sure I understand. Okay, so if we wanted to implement something like this at our school, we'd set up an advisory board for this, and then we would kind of um, start training people, the faculty, staff, and students, kind of all using the same language. And then as I go through your website, they would submit the resume on their on their basic skills and then go through the process. Mm -hmm. I've kind of looked across the process. So I guess the question, now I lost my question. Okay. They would go through the whole process. Yes. There we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And receive feedback from a group of experts. Is, the, is that group of experts going to be? It's going to be a combination of staff and faculty. Subject matter okay. experts are okay. faculty and then. Okay. Then they receive their pen. Do you, okay, I remember my question now. Are we going to do training with the students on the rubrics of the Seals of Excellence? Mm. Would that be something that you would do? Mm like different trainings to yes. say, okay, this seal of, sorry, yes, this seal do. of excellence, da, 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 and here's the training for it. With, yes. At the student level. Per yeah, at the student area. level. So we did, um, we did do some of those trainings during our, pi our pilot program, um, and that was partially because it was a pilot group. We wanted to make sure that the pilot group, we focused on campus, I mean, campus recreation, student housing, residential life. We wanted to say, you're a part of this pilot group. Here's what this means. Here's what, only because we needed feedback on the process. Um, so we, we did that intentionally. We have talked about it somewhat as we do a full launch, um, but we've also realized that our students, at least here at the University of Houston, they're doing a ton, right? So um, the realities of them probably coming to a training session about the program is probably pretty slim. That was intentional on our part to put as much online as possible. If what we found with our students, their yeah. first stop is to go to a website. Let me see what I can yeah. figure out on my own, on my own time, click on these resources. And if we put as much as possible there and they know as much, okay, I get it, right? Our students are pretty smart. I see mm -hmm. an example of a cover letter. I see an example of a resume. Mm -hmm. I see the steps pretty laid out. Mm -hmm. they've, they've picked up on it pretty quickly. Okay. So maybe even having an app on it would be like really mm -hmm. cool. Okay, yeah. that's a good idea. I got it. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, that exercise we did at the beginning of looking at all the different foundational outcomes, mm -hmm. it took a long time. So, I mean, again, it's funny. It, it yeah. takes some time to build that in, but I think it's an important part of having that conversation because I can't walk into a physics area and say this is why learning outcomes are important if I can't connect it with a conversation yeah. that they're having in their own ways right so making sure that it's mapped to things that aren't just like they think that I've made all of this up right so we actually use that foundational document to talk to faculty partners not so much with students right so the we try to cater our conversation to the audience um, I have a question I was y'all do y'all have a first year experience class and do you use that as a way to no, you don't we have don't one. Have we one don't here. have one here. But if you that have one. That would be a one, great way to, I think it's to, a great to market it. Yeah. And then I had one more question. Um, would you be willing to share any of the templates oh, of course. with other sure. schools if we wanted sure. to start something? they're also Absolutely. online. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, great. And you'll have access to them. Yeah, everything you have um, handed out to you should be on our website. Um, but um, we can also um, yeah. get some contact information. We're happy to share whatever. If you want to jump on the phone call, we're happy to talk through um, some of this process with you as well. Um, I think the other piece to that training piece is such important, so important to create Kales Campus allies. We can't be the only ones that know how this process works, right? So um, even if we don't hold a specific training for students, if they're hearing it from all these different places, um, they'll hopefully realize that it's an important part, um, important part of their campus experience. And I was going to say, if you wanted to incorporate additional training to just bring the students together, um, you could incorporate that in your process and just try it as a pilot. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And do you still have the microphone? Give it away. <laughs> Kay wants it, even though Kay does not want the microphone. We don't Kay want her to. We don't want her to. <laughs> yes. To get on the recording. All right. Good yeah. to see you again. <laughs> um, just one uh, before we. Uh, one question is. Increasingly, the reality and the uh, rhetoric is to enroll more students with disabilities mm -hmm. 
and military affiliated, which may or may not include students with disabilities. So the question becomes, is there anything in this excellence and leadership and uh, <laughs> all of this, do you in any way in your rubrics or in your training uh, make any consideration for ADA students or, or students with disabilities? Because where you start and where you end up, progress for one at the end of the process may look very different than for others. So how do you individualize and diversify even in the process? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. So one of the thoughts mm -hmm. is um, this partnership with Career Services. Mm -hmm. Also, we work really close with Center of Disabilities as well as Veteran Services. Like, so they're, they're within our division, but also important colleagues. Um, but this communication and the articulation of growth and development is important. So this, we apply it the same way we would say, yes, you learned this in high school, and you want to be able to say, how did I grow and develop? It could be that I was at a certain basic level, and now I'm here, which demonstrates that I have growth in that area. So I think it's important that we coach students on how to articulate that growth, and that also to employers say, you know, I'm a student who has a particular disability, but I've been able to grow and develop in this way, and this is important to your business because I can also continue to grow in this way with you. Like, so if they can be able to communicate that through, and we hope to coach them through how to share that and be able to advocate for their own needs, but at the same time be able to demonstrate that they've grown and they have the strengths that are helpful for our employers after they leave. Yes. And I was going to add to, um, the student will get a chance to select themselves, like their experience, you know, and how they want to share that. And I know Tina and our departments, we work together with the Center for uh, students with disabilities, and we talked about how do they disclose their disabilities to an mm -hmm. employer and how do they articulate it. And it was three departments coming mm -hmm. together and having a panel of experts, employers, students with disabilities, and it was just really encouraging and inspiring for that student. And we invited all the students that we know of with those disabilities. Mm -hmm. And like uh, Pam said, we are part of the Division of Student uh, uh, Affairs and Enrollment Services, so we have access to all the 28 departments and our directors and they know about this program so that makes it a little bit easier uh, for us and making sure that language is consistent with veteran <laughs> services mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. one more question is this mostly with co-curricular programs yes. have you thought about partnering with faculty who would put some of these seals mm -hmm. on their syllabi and say mm -hmm. if you take this course you can apply it towards diversity or Yes, we have, and I know Tina and I, we actually sat on the QEP uh, task force, and our QEP curriculum would be a co-curriculum theme, and so we've already had those discussions about the syllabi and taking those experiences, even if they're doing a study abroad and art history, and they want to use an example and mm -hmm. actually get a seal on the Scarlet Seal, so we have had those conversations. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great connection to our faculty members. As Monica said, it's part of our accreditation process, which is exciting. Um, that Scarlet Seals will be um, a part of the reflective piece um, on the academic um, on the academic proposal that's being submitted. So that is exciting. And I think again, um, the students can pull that learning from anywhere. Um, so we have definitely seen submissions where people talk about group projects in the classroom. Um, so as we work in the co-curricular side. Um, of the institution, we definitely want students to realize that this learning is across their experience and that, this, that their learning and being a student organization president definitely connects with their learning in the classroom. And that's, that's important as well. I see Ginger okay. standing I know, Ginger standing well, Just yeah. remember we have extra copies so here fine. and we'll be available. Yeah, and we're here. And we'll, so, and we'll get all of the electronic copies yeah. and post them online as well. Um, so thank you for that. I just want to, um, I mean, again, I know we've talked about how different campuses have different resources available to them. Uh, think about what, because there's so much rich information here this morning. What can you pull out to work on your campus? Like, what is the, is there an initiative that exists on your campus right now that you could tie some of this work to? It doesn't have to be the full-fledged uh, seals of excellence. If you can do that, that, that's wonderful. But is there something smaller on your campus, something that your leadership is already vested in mm -hmm. that you could tie some of this work to? Mm -hmm. And especially that slide that shows all of their partners, I never, I never thought about engaging the registrar. Mm -hmm. That's a really great idea, but I hadn't thought of it. So this is a really rich list for you to think about. Um, and, you know, think about what's, what's one conversation you can have when you go back to your campus, one conversation with one person to try to move towards this kind of an effort. 
Like, who could you talk to to make this happen? For some of you, it may be your career services person because you're, you're not that person here today. But if you are the career services person, is there a chair? Is there a dean? Is there a provost? Is there one conversation you can have to start moving towards this? So again, this is an idea for you to take back with you. Um, a lot of rich information. Pick out what you can to use on your campuses. Um, and we'll provide what support that, that we can. Yeah, absolutely. Please use all of us as a resource, uh, mostly them, because I didn't do their work <laughs> on there. So um, we do want to make, um, um, well, just a little, speaking of marketing that you talked about earlier, if you are on Twitter and you would like to tweet something about the conference, uh, hashtag marketable skills spelled out, or hashtag 60 by 30 texts, um, and lunch will be served during the keynote. So unless you have anything else you'd like to say, well, let's have a big round of applause for this morning.